captured slaves. Uh, they were kind of forced into that situation because of financial debt. And so their status as a slave actually kept them alive. But Paul had no problem here with a slave becoming free. With a slave buying their freedom, redeeming themselves out of it. But his point is that becoming a freed man is not necessary to live a spiritual life in Christ. You can be a slave and you can be free in Christ, he says. You can be free from the mastery of sin the, uh, and the accusations of the law. You are a free man, he says, regardless of your outward status. And that is Paul's point. And it's one of the most beautiful truths. I don't think we think about it much, but it's one of the most beautiful truths about the Christian faith. Outward status matters little when it comes to living the genuine life of faith in Christ. Matters little. In fact, I think it's by God's beautiful design that people of faith can live in all kinds of social contexts and cultures throughout the world. You can be a genuine believer whether or not you are a man or a woman or a child. You can be a genuine believer regardless of your economic status, whether you're impoverished and poor or whether you're rich. You can be a genuine Christian regardless of your racial and ethnic background. It doesn't matter what language you speak, you can be a believer. You can be a Christian whether or not you're single or or married or divorced. You can live the Christian life regardless of your social circumstances. You can be a Christian living in all forms of government, even the cruel and oppressive ones all throughout the world and all the different nations. And that's because the foot or the, 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 the ground at the foot of the cross is a level place. It's a place that, that, that is accessible from, from a people of all social contexts. All different backgrounds can come to the cross and they can receive salvation. They can receive a new identity in Christ. And they're unified as a body of believers. And then they, in turn, can leave from the cross and live their lives in whatever background Christ called them from. And so the key point is that the Christian faith is transferable. It's transferable to any social and cultural context in the world. And so, let's think about that for a minute. You don't identify... A Christian, based on whether or not they're a slave or a free man. You don't identify a Christian based on where they live in the world, right? You you don't identify a believer by the language they speak. You, You don't identify them by the cultural norms all throughout the world, the foods they eat or the the dress of a certain culture. You don't identify a Christian even by how close they live in proximity to a church building. You identify a genuine believer by how they live their lives. Not outward circumstances, but the life of Christ being manifest in them where they live. And this big idea of of having a transferable faith, the Christian faith can be transferred into any context, has a couple of implications I want us to see this morning. And the first one is an implication for the church. The church as a whole. The second one that I want to look at is an implication for the individual believer. And so what's an implication for the church based on this transferable faith? Uh... The first thing is that Christianity was not meant to be a social revolution. The church is not a social revolution, a social movement in that sense. I don't know if any of you have seen the uh, uh, the miniseries that was on the History Channel a couple of years back called The Bible. 
It, uh, it was shown, uh, um, I don't know, two or three years ago, and, and, and they, um, they took a portion of that miniseries and, and turned it into a movie called The Son of God, I believe. Well, anyway, there was this miniseries um, on TV about that. And there was, a, there was a controversial scene in the movie in which Jesus is shown calling Peter as a disciple. And uh, Jesus miraculously, as we know in Scripture, helps Peter catch an overwhelming amount of fish. And he extends an invitation to Peter, Come follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. Right? But in the movie, uh, the director of the movie has Peter ask Jesus, Well, okay, so, so what are we going to do? And then Jesus answers him in the movie, we're going to change the world. We're going to change the world. Now, now Christ never makes that comment in Scripture. And, and we're really not sure what the producers of the movie had in mind when they, when they had Christ say, we're going to change the world. And obviously they have to take some creative license. But there were many people who took that comment from that movie to mean that Christ had commissioned the church, His followers, to go right the wrongs of the world. To, to go out and, and to be a movement of people set on eliminating all the social justice, injustice, I'm sorry, in the world. But I want to point out that that view of Christianity is subtly wrong. It's off by a little bit. Christianity is not a, a social revolution, not a social movement that way. The church is a body of people whose primary task is to make disciples. Its task is to proclaim the gospel, not end in justice. And so we preach the gospel, and what gets revolutionized is not the social structures of the world, but individual human hearts. That's the revolution that Christianity causes. It's, it's, a, it's a change of the world, but it's through spiritual regeneration, not through social revolution. The genuine believer, the person who has genuinely trusted Christ by placing his faith in Him, has had their heart changed, had their heart made right with God. It has been washed, Scripture tells us. It's been born again by the Spirit. It, it has taken a heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh. And so the primary purpose of the gospel and, and, and the mission of the church is to change people. It's to change people, not society. Its focus is inward and on the heart, not outward and on societal change. It's a subtle difference. The funny thing is, though, is that people who have their heart transformed by the Holy Spirit and through the Gospel and they're receiving Christ in faith do do a lot of good in this world. They do take on social causes. So indirectly, Christianity does a lot of good. Christians become salt and light. And throughout history, many individual Christians have done good. They've even spoken out against slavery. They've fed the poor. They've helped the oppressed, the sick. But I want us to see that Christianity is not, is not primarily a movement of social change. It's people living transformed lives, whatever place, whatever condition, God has placed them in. And Paul says, be content where you are at, living for Christ. You know, if Paul wanted to make Christianity into a social movement, this was the passage he could have done that with, right? Where, where he addresses slavery. He could have encouraged the Corinthians to throw off their slavery. To, to form a movement to speak against this injustice. But he didn't. But he did have a revolutionary idea for Christian slaves. You can find it in Ephesians chapter 6. You want to turn in your Bibles there with me? Ephesians chapter 6. 
He says, Christian slaves, this is the kind of revolution that you ought to be seeking. Ephesians 6, verse 5. I'm glad enough of you still have paper Bibles that I can hear when you're done turning your pages. He says, bond servants are slaves. Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or he is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening knowing that He is both their Master and yours is in heaven, and, that's, and that there is no partiality with Him. So Paul says, Slaves, here's, here's how you start a revolution. Live like Christ. Live like Christ as a slave. Allow your transformed heart to demonstrate the life of Christ. Do everything as unto the Lord, Paul says, as though you were serving Jesus. Jesus is your boss, not your earthly master. And even though your conditions are oppressive, don't, out of discontentment, think you can't live for Christ where you're at. Revolutionize the world right where you are. Live for Christ. And you know, that's that's the thought that I think every Christian living in every circumstance throughout the world, needs to embrace. That's our own revolutionary thought that we ought to hold dear to our hearts. Live whatever life you are in as unto the Lord. Start your your own revolution right where you are at. May it begin in your heart and work its way out into that situation where you live. And so you can be a revolutionary if you're, if you're a stay-at-home mom. You, you can be a revolutionary if, you, if you're going to Colby High School or Colby Middle School or wherever you go to school, right where you're at. You can be a revolutionary in your job, even if you don't like it. You could be a revolutionary as a boss, Live for Christ as unto the Lord is a revolutionary statement for every Christian living wherever they may find that God has placed them. That leads me to the last point this morning. And it's, it's something for the individual believer. The first one was for the church. We're not a social revolution. Second one is for the believer. You do not have to change your social status or circumstances to begin living for Christ. You do not have to have that upgrade to start manifesting the life of Christ where you live. It's transferable, this faith that we have is transferable to where you're at right now. doesn't matter if you're a slave or a freeman, circumcised, uncircumcised, doesn't matter. But what Paul doesn't tell us in this passage, and we all instinctively know, is that it isn't equally easy, right, to live for Christ in every set of circumstances. Not always easy. You, you, could, be, you could be one of the estimated 100 million Christians who, who live in a Middle Eastern country who suffer persecution every day. But God has called them to live for Christ. Right there. Uh, you, you could be uh, uh, the only Christian in your family. And I think there may be some of you like that here this morning. You could be the only Christian in your family. And your family may be hostile even towards your faith. Or if you're lucky, ambivalent. But God has called you to live for Christ. Right there. You can't upgrade your family anyway. You're stuck with them, Right? You could be the only person of faith in your class at school. 
Or it may seem like it. But God has called you to live for Christ as unto the Lord in that situation. You know, there's a guarantee. There's a guarantee for all of us. If you attempt to live the godly life, if you attempt to render your life as unto the Lord, as Paul says about slaves, you will what? What does Scripture tell us? You will suffer. You will suffer. Philippians 1.29 It's been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you not only believe in Him, but you suffer for His sake. 2 Timothy 3 All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Right? And so our challenge is Manifest the life of Christ no matter what circumstance that we live in. You know, and if I could borrow this cliche, we could put it another way. Bloom where you're planted. Have you heard that? Bloom where you're planted. God has, God has planted you in a certain spot, in a certain culture, with a certain group of people. Live for Christ in that place. You know, sometimes sometimes life can be found in places nobody ever thought it was possible, in unexpected places. You know, the planet Mars is, is one of those places, right? It's, it's a very cold and, and uh, inhospitable environment, and it's so dry that, that, that you have these massive dust storms that basically cover the surface at times, and, and the atmosphere allows in a lot of radiation, more harmful radiation than we find here on Earth. But yet, there are a lot of people, a lot of scientists who are saying, we're convinced that one day we're going to find life there, at least in the bacteria form, on the planet Mars. Why do they say that? Well, the reason is because they keep finding it in unexpected places here on planet Earth. They go to places like uh, extreme deserts where the alkaline level is so high that it's deadly and, and they're finding, finding life there. Not massive amounts, but, but there's life there. Um, they go to extreme Arctic places and regions and find life that's trapped in ice and life that endures you know, uh, sub-zero temperatures all year round. Go to the bottom of the ocean. And inside these geothermal vents at the very bottom, they, they find life that somehow is thriving in utter blackness and in superheated temperatures. So they think that eventually we're going to find life on Mars because we keep finding it in unusual places here on Earth. And they've actually coined a term to describe an organism that they find living in unexpected places, that they find thriving in unexpected places. They call these organisms an extremophile. An extremophile. And you know, sometimes as Christians, we are called to be extremophiles. Manifesting life under conditions that aren't conducive. Manifesting the life of Christ even when the conditions would say, boy, you ought to be discontent. Christian extremophiles. You know, I think as our, our culture continues to, to, to drift its post-Christian direction, I, 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 think, I think that we're going to find that the church needs more Christians willing to live like an extremophile. People who are willing to sacrifice contentedness in order to live a life as unto the Lord. You know, there's many of you in here this morning that already live that sort of life. Like I said, I know there's some that come from families that don't support your faith. There's some in hostile work environments. It's 
just want to encourage you this morning. Continue to manifest the life of the Lord. Continue to give yourself as unto the Lord. It may be difficult, but God notices it. And He will reward those who persevere. And the challenge I kind of want to issue to all of us is are we guilty of Thomas Kincaid syndrome as believers? Do, do we fall into that trap? Are we, are we more focused on climbing that ladder of contentment that all we do is look for greener grass and tell ourselves, when I get there, that's when I'll start really living for Christ. That's when I'll make a commitment. Can I challenge you? Embrace this idea as unto the Lord where you're living. You know, I think we need to cultivate in our hearts this idea that Christ is worthy of us giving up every single bit of our worldly contentedness for. Every single bit. He's, he's the pearl of great price. He, he, is, he is so valuable that a man ought to sell everything he has just to possess him. Is he your greatest treasure? Or is he a minor irritant on the climb up the ladder of contentment? Let's close in prayer. Father, I, uh, I do pray that you would fuel our hearts with love for Christ. I think sometimes we move so far away from the idea of what he has done for us. And I, I, and I pray that you would just open the eyes of our heart that we may see Christ in fresh new ways. Be reminded of what He was willing to do for us. To have us be constrained by a love for Him. That we would gladly live our lives as unto the Lord. And we pray this in His name. Amen. Let's stand together and close.